This is Benjamin reading on behalf of the Beverly Reading Channel. I'm going to be reading today the Braid HTTP Synchronization for HTTP paper, which was published on July 10th, 2020, by Michael Tuman, G. Little, R. Walker, Walker, and B. Bellamy. Bellamy. Braid. Braid HTTP Synchronization for HTTP. Abstract. Braid is a set of extensions that generalize HTTP from a state transfer protocol into a state synchronization protocol. Braid puts the power of operational transform and CRDTs on the web, improving network performance and enabling natively peer-to-peer -peer collaboratively editable offline-first web applications. Braid is composed of four extensions to HTTP. One, versioning on resources. Two, subscriptions on GET requests, three, patches created from range requests, four, merge types that specify original transform or CRDT behavior. These extensions are independent. Each provides a distinct value for a standalone use case. However, when used together, they enable a web resource to synchronize automatically across multiple clients, servers, and proxies, and support arbitrary simultaneous edits by multiple writers under arbitrary network delays and partitions, while guaranteeing consistency using an original transform, CRDT, or other algorithm. These synchronization features provide a step towards a standard for the dynamic internal state of websites. Web programmers currently synchronize state across clients and servers with layers of non-standard JavaScript frameworks. A synchronization standard built upon REST can enable programmers to read and write the internal state of any website as easily as a local variable on their own site. This could enable a separation of UI from state and allow any user to edit or choose their own UI for any website state. Introduction. HTTP transfers a static version of state within a single request and response. If the state changes, HTTP does not automatically update clients with the new versions. This design satisfies to when web pages were mostly static and written by hand. However, today's websites are dynamic, generated from layers of state in databases, and provide real-time updates across multiple clients and servers. Programmers today need to synchronize, not just transfer state, and to do this, they must work around HTTP. The web has a long history of these workarounds. The original web required users to click reload when a page changed. XML HTTP request, XHR, made it possible to update just part of a page, running a GET request behind the scenes. However, a GET request still could not push updates. To work around this, web programmers would poll the resource, which was inefficient. Long polling, was invented to overcome the inefficiencies, which was standardized as server sent events, SSE. Yet, SSE provides semantics of an event stream, not an update stream. And although a programmer can encode a protocol within the event stream for updating a resource, there is still no standard way to express the update of a resource. In practice, Web programmers today often give up on using standards for data that changes, and instead, custom messages over a WebSocket, a hand-rolled synchronization protocol. Unfortunately, this forfeits the benefits of HTTP and REST, such as caching and a uniform interface, REST. As the web becomes increasingly dynamic, web applications are forced to implement additional layers of non-standard JavaScript frameworks to synchronize changes to state. Braid generalizes HTTP into a synchronization protocol and REST into a synchronization architecture. It adds these features. 1. Versioning. Each resource has a history of changes ordered in time. 2. Subscriptions. A subscribe header can be added to GET requests, which promises to push all future versions to the client until the client says, for GET. Three, range patches. 
express changes to versions and patches with a uniform format based on range requests. Four, merge types. If multiple clients and servers simultaneously edit the same resource, they can guarantee a consistent resulting state by implementing the same merge type. Resources specify the merge type with a header. Taken together, these features allow an arbitrary set of clients and servers to make arbitrary edits to resources under arbitrary network delays and petitions, and merge all edits consistently, receiving updates as soon as they reconnect. This enables caches to support dynamic content, web applications to feature in offline mode, and text areas to support collaborative editing. Chapter two, versioning for resources. Each braid resource has a current version and a version history. Versions are specified as a string in the structured headers format. Each version string must be unique to differentiate any two points in time. To specify the version of content in a request or a response body, a version header may be included in a request for a put, patch, or post, or in the response to a get. For example, version colon quote DKN7OV2VWG end quote. Each version has a set of parents that denote the most recent parent version or versions that were known at the time the version was created. The full graph of parents forms a directed, a cyclic graph, a DAG, representing the known partial order of all versions. A version A is known to have occurred before a version B if and only if A is an ancestor of B in the partial order. Parents are also specified with a header in a put request or a get response. For example, parents, colon, quote, AGTVA12 kit, end quote, comma, quote, CMD, PVK, PLL2, end quote. The parent's header is a list of strings in the syntax of HTTP's structured headers. Each string is a version. For any two parent versions, A and B, that are specified in a parent's header, A cannot be a descendant of B or vice versa. The ordering of versions in the list carries no meaning and should be softed lexicographically. If a client or server does not specify a version for a resource it transfers, the recipient may generate a new version ID of its own choosing. If a client or server does not specify a parent's header when transferring a new version, the recipient may presume that the most recent versions it has seen are the parents of the new version. So it's not saying this should objectively be the case, but even if it is subjectively the case, it's good enough. Chapter 2.1, comparison with e-tag. The version header is similar to an e-tag, but has two differences. The first difference, e-tags are sensitive to content encoding. If you send the same version with a gzip content encoding, it will have a different e-tag, but the same version. The second difference, a version marks a unique point in time, not unique content. If a resource is changed from version A to B and then to C, such that the contents of A are the same as the contents at C, then it is possible versions A and C to have the same e-tag, even though they have different versions. Chapter 2.2, put a new version. When a put request changes the state of a resource, it can specify the new version of the resource. The parent versions that existed when it was created and the way multiple simultaneous changes should be merged, the merge type. For example, a put request to the URL slash chat will have the version header ej4lhb 
9Z78. The parents, OIKWN 5B 8QH, as well as UC 9Z WH W 7MF. The content type, application slash JSON, merge type, sync 9, and content length header, 73. The body of this request will be a array containing an object with a field text set to hi everyone and the field author set to an object of which the field type is set to link and the field value is set to slash user slash Tommy. In response, there will be a HTTP slash 1.1 response with a status code 200 OK and the header patches colon OK. Merge types are specified in merge types. The version and parents headers are optional. If version is omitted, okay, version is omitted, the recipient may invent a version ID. If parents is omitted, the recipient may assume that the current set of leaf versions on its machine is the version's context. What's the version's context? Okay, I'm going to assume we don't know what a version context is yet. This example includes the entire new value of the state, but one can also send updates as patches. Okay, so this is the entire thing, so it sent the whole thing. They're not sending it as a patch. Okay. Chapter 2.3, put a new version as a patch. Not only are patches smaller and thus more efficient, they also provide useful information for merging two simultaneous edits. For instance, in collaborative editing. One can send an update in a patch by setting the patches header to a number and then set the message body to a sequence of that many patches separated by blank lines. For example, take the request as a put method directed to slash chat as a version header of g09 dot 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 dot. It has parents, a single parent of ej4 dot 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 dot. Content type, application slash JSON. Merge type, sync 9, patches 2. Now we begin the first patch segment of this request. With a content length header of 62, a content range header of JSON space dot messages open square bracket one colon one end square bracket. With the body of this patch being a array containing an object which text field is equal to the string yo and the author field equal to an object which contains two fields. The first field is type equal to the string link and the second field equal to value containing the string slash user slash yobot. The second patch segment of this request has a content length header of 40, the content range header of JSON space dot latest change, and the body contains a JSON object with the type field equal to date and the value field equal to an example integer. The response will be HTTP slash 1.1 with a status code of 200 OK, with the patches header equal to OK. In order to distinguish each patch within a version, we need to know the length of the patch. To know the length of the patch, each patch must include one of the following headers. Content length equal to an integer and transfer encoding equal to chunked. Either of these provide a way to determine when the next message starts. The previous example uses the range patch format, which is defined in range patch. However, one can use any patch format by sending a patch with a content type header set to a patch format with a defined behavior, such as an application slash JSON dash patch plus JSON as specified in RFC 6902. For example, there is a request with a put method directed to slash chat. The version header set to an example string, parent sent to another example string, content type set to application slash JSON, merge type set to sync 9, patches 
set to the integer one. Content length set to the integer 326. Content type set to application slash JSON dash patch plus JSON. With the body of an array of a set of objects with an op field that varies between test, remove, add, replace, move, copy, a path field that changes sometimes, and but it's a string, generally to, I guess, a a address of the value that is being modified and also uh, for uh, some operations uh, there will be a value field um, okay so for and the body containing an array with a set of objects the first object having an op field set to the string value of test a path field set to the string value of slash a slash b slash c and the value field set to a string value of foo the second object having an op field set to a string value of remove and a path field set to the string value of slash a slash b slash c the third object having an op field set to the string value of add a path field set to the string value of slash a slash b slash c and the value field set to an empty array. The fourth object has an op field set to the value replace and a path field set to the value of slash a slash b slash c and the value field set to the integer 42. The fifth object has an op field set to move the string move a from field set to slash a slash b and a path field set to slash a slash d and the final object has a op field set to the string value copy and a from field set to slash a slash d slash d and a path field set to slash a slash d slash e Okay, so we can see we've got examples for test. Not really sure what that does, the test operation. We also have remove, um, which will probably remove it away. We also have add, which I guess is for creating of a new value or maybe even a pending, I'm not sure. Uh, and we have replace, um, which I guess just deletes and then recreates it. Um, and we have move. Uh, which is self-explanatory, and we also have copy, which is self-explanatory. Uh, both move and copy take a from and a path field. And the response will be HTTP slash 1.1 with a status code 200 OK and a header, a patches header of OK. Chapter 2.4, get a specific version. A server can optionally allow clients to request historical versions of a resource in get requests. To request a historical version, a client includes a version and or parents header in the request. For example, a request with a get method directed to slash chat with a version header directed to an example string will in turn receive the response with HTTP slash 1.1, the status code 209 subscription, the header subscribe set to the value keep alive the version header set to an example string the parents header set to two example strings the content type header set to application slash json merge type set to sync 9 and content length header set to the integer 73 containing for a body a array containing an object with the text field set to hi everyone as a string value and the author field containing an object of two fields the first field being type set to the string value link the second field being called value containing a string value called slash user slash tommy if a get request contains a version header then the subscribe header section three must be absent the server should return a single response containing that version of the resource in its body 
with the version header set to the version requested by the client. So we're just fetching a version. And that's all the details actually about this version. So we get the version. Okay, so that's the same value that we fetched. These are the parents of it. And then that's its details. That's the merge type that should be used, I guess, for this path chat. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Alrighty. If the server does not support historical versions, it may ignore the version header and respond as usual, but must not include the version header in its response. Okay, so that's just like pre-braid. If a get request contains a parent's header, then if the request does not also contain a version, then the request must also contain a subscribe header and the server should send a set of versions connecting the parents to the current version and then subscribe the client to future updates. Okay, all right, so if it only contains a parents header and no version header, then essentially it seems what needs to happen is uh, the request that must include a subscribe header and that is so the server can send uh, a trickling of all of the weaves within the braid to get the requester um, up to date with the history of the current version. So it's a way of transforming um, a location within a braid, an arbitrary location because we don't have the specific version identifier. So it's an arbitrary location within a braid um kind of that we do know right because we have the parents so it's we're kind of just saying there um but without saying specifically that version we haven't labeled it yet we don't have an identifier we're just pointing to it uh and then the server is now uh obligated to get this request up up to date so trying to convert it into a version um so instead of just giving them a version number back maybe that would then perhaps indicate that um, that they're already at the latest version, maybe. Um, it doesn't really tell them how to get to that latest version. Maybe that's important to the application as well. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I guess we'll find out. So what needs to happen then is the version, yeah, so it will send back all the knots within the braid or the weaves within the braid um, back to the client and then they can follow it all down, I guess. Um, and then pop out to the last one. And it seems a little bit strange because maybe, uh, they should probably just be able to jump directly to the latest version. Um, but in which case, why would they send parents header if they just want to jump directly to the latest version? Um, so that would probably be this one, right? Like just send the, like if we're just requesting uh, slash chat and we emit version, so we're just doing a, a normal get request, uh, then we're probably just requesting the latest. So why would someone want, so I guess the reason why you would do parents, like only a parents header, no version header, and why you would even include parents in the first place is you do want this historical data, I guess maybe, so the rendering in your application is really cool. Oh, and okay, an example of this could be like in a chess game, uh, maybe. Um, so that way you can animate all the moves that occur within a chess game uh, to get the user visually up to date with what happened rather than just changing the entire board. Um, however, why would someone know the parents but not the version number? That's where I'm a little bit confused. Like when would this uh, part here actually be a valid uh, situation. Um, when would a requester ever just want to do this? Okay, if the request also contains a version, then the server should respond with a set of versions that connect the specified parents with the specified version and then close the connection. And if the server does not support historical versions, then it may ignore the parent's header, but must not include the parent's header in its response. Okay, so that would just be like a compatibility thing. So if it doesn't really know what it is, then it shouldn't pretend as if it knows. 
Um, but this one, I'm still not sure why that would be the case. If the request also contains a version header, then the server should respond with a set of versions that connect the specified parents with the specified version and then can close the connection. Okay, so why would this one leave the connection open and do the subscribe header thing, but this one doesn't? Like, that's what I don't get. Like, when would I do this versus do this? What's the context of when I would do these two? I'm not sure. Maybe it'll explain it later. Right. A server may refactor or rebase the version history that it provides to a client, so long as it does not affect the resulting state or the result of the patch types mergers. Okay, so essentially it's saying the server is allowed to compress the history or amend the history or do whatever it's needed to do. Um, as long as it's not interfering with, I guess, the um, the eventual outcome, the end goal. So for instance, like in Git, uh, you can kind of squash merge things, you can rebase to like put new, your new local commits on top of the end of the remote commits, um, which kind of helps sometimes with Git histories or just cleaning things up. Uh, so it's kind of saying like, you know, you can probably compress changes or do things that's up to the server. Um, but yeah, it, it allows it, um, as long as the outcome is still going to be the same, you can't, you know, trick anyone. Alrighty. Chapter three, subscriptions for get. If a get request includes a subscribe header, it will return a stream of versions. A new version push with each change. Each version can contain either the new contents in its body or a set of patches. For example, take the request, it's a get method directed to slash chat and a subscribe header of the value keep alive. It will have a response that will contain multiple versions. Inside the first response, it will contain a body Inside the second uh, version response, it will contain a patch. And inside the third version response, it will also contain a patch. And inside the third version, res no, yeah, the fourth version response, uh, it will also contain a patch. So We've emitted uh, the version header, we've emitted the parents header here. All we've done is get chat and subscribe. Uh, so it's responding with varying version headers, uh, varying parent. Uh, okay, so in the first one, we've got version ej4 uh, dot dot dot. And the second version response, the parent will now be the value of that previous version. And that will continue on that chain. So the third version response, uh, the parents will be the value, the parents header will be set to the value of the second response's version. And the fourth version header, uh, sorry, the fourth version response segment will be have a parents header set to the value the version uh the value of the version header of the third version segment in the response um so we've got a chain here uh within a chain of version history um, that's securing. Uh, it's subscribed, so I believe what this will happen uh, with this HTTP method uh, is it'll just stay alive, it'll keep open. Um, so rather than the connection closing, it'll keep stay alive and the server will keep sending things as things occur and the uh, receiver will receive things as things occur. Uh, so kind of like the way WebSockets operate, um, 
a bit different than long polling. So more like the way WebSockets is operating, kind of built into HTTP, it seems here. Um, which to some extent is still possible uh, with HTTP. You don't really need WebSockets for it. You can do HTTP with TCP. But I think the issue of why people went to WebSockets was because if there is an issue within TCP, uh, like a disconnection, things like that, things kind of get costly at the lower level protocol, or maybe it's a little bit fragile. Uh, so that's why HTTP is kind of like a, a standard that builds on top of things like UDP, TCP. What? Actually, I wonder if HTTP actually builds on top of UDP. Um, but yeah, HTTP, HTTP definitely builds on top of TCP. But then again, you now have modern browsers like Google Chrome uh, that actually uses Quick, uh, Q-U-I-C, uh, as its transport layer um, if the web server supports it. Uh, so if you're using Cloudflare, then many web servers will actually, your Cloudflare will work as a CDN proxy in front of your actual web page. And it'll, so it's a middleman between the user and your web server. Um, and being a middleman, it's able to actually provide like all the latest technologies in terms of sending your data or archiving it or in terms of archiving it for distribution on its content delivery network, its CDN, uh, across the world to the user, wherever they are. Uh, and it can do this through uh, numerous upgrades to that your normal web server may not actually support. Uh, so it because as a proxy, it doesn't actually need to upgrade your web server. It can just uh, upgrade the connection between uh, your web server and the user. Uh, so there's, uh, even though it's still HTTP, uh, it may be using a different transport if you're using Google Chrome connected to like a Cloudflare website. I believe it could probably be using Quick. Um, I'm also not sure whether uh, things like you know, HTTP 1, HTTP 2, HTTP uh, version 3, uh, and maybe there's a version 4 that's in draft stage or whatnot, uh, whether or not these uh, these incremental versions of HTTP added support for these new transports underneath um, to kind of allow that. So at least that's some background um, for for how such a subscription could probably be possible. I assume it's going to be, maybe it has to be a TCP, like keep alive type thing, or it'll be like a web socket, or maybe it'll be quick. I wonder how they actually implement um, this, this uh, HTTP method uh, called 209 subscription. I wonder how they do it. Alrighty, um, so back uh, to what's occurring here. So we get uh, the first version. I wonder if this is actually the beginning or whether or not it's just like the initial one at the time of the request. I assume it's just gonna be the initial one at the time of request. And these ones would be like subsequent ones that have happened since this request occurred. Uh, so the initial one, we get like a same similar example to the beginning where it's an array containing an object with the field text set to hi everyone in author containing an object with the type field set to a string link and the value field set to a string slash user slash Tommy. So the second one uses that as a parent, second version segment in the response uses uh, that previous version segment as its parent uh, and uh, has a new version uh, identifier. So uses the sync nine, they all use the sync nine merge type uh, however, it introduces a patches uh, header set to the integer one. All subsequent version responses in this all have the same patches uh, equal to one. Uh, so I'm not sure what that's about. Oh, I know what that'll be about. That will be to say how many patches are included. So I think if we go back, yeah. So if we go back to chapter 2.3, we can see this version segment um, included two patches within its version segment. Um, so why would one include two patches within a version segment? Oh, you know, it'll be, it'll be when there's a conflict. 
Uh, so two people wrote to it at the same time, like wrote to the same version at the same time. You now have two leaves or two children of that version. Um, and then that will be resolved uh, into uh, the subsequent version of consolidated, uh, resolved, reconciled um, into the next. So for instance, uh, I would imagine this example here is when uh, maybe two occurred at the same time. Um, and okay, and maybe they're actually writing different, no, they're still writing in chat. Um, so I wonder then why this one is, okay, JSON latest change. Okay, so we submit this new message and then maybe this is a patch onto that message. Um, so we're kind of modifying this. So rather than just including type date uh, value into here, uh, we're modifying it after. So it's a little bit different than what I thought it would be. Um, Because these aren't conflicting, right? Like these are these are working together. So essentially, we need to find out what this content range is doing to kind of understand what's going on, whether or not multiple patches, like how multiple patches are instructing uh, what's going on. So going back to the chapter three example we've been wrestling with. So the first version segment it doesn't have a content range header, but the second the third and the fourth version headers no sorry the second and the third version version segments i uh, do have a content range header uh, and the fourth version segment does not so the second version segment has a content range header of json dot messages open square bracket one colon one and square bracket uh, and it's another type of message one uh, for its body, it's a array containing an object with text field equaling the string value of yo and an author uh, object uh, directed by user slash yo bot. And for version, for the sec the third version segment, uh, it's content range JSON dot messages to uh, colon two. So I guess maybe this is an injection. Um, Cause this one, it never says like json.messages. Like we're not saying like dump this in a json.messages uh, zero colon zero, right? So how does it know, like what's this dot messages? It must like the protocol must seem to be aware of what dot messages means because it seems like it already knows that it should append this into this value. Um, or rather, because it's an array, it should concatenate it. Um, so the fourth version segment of that chapter three response uh, is the content type of application slash JSON dash patch plus JSON. Uh, so that's an array of objects, uh, which are operations. Uh, the first operation is a test, then it's a remove, then it's an add, then it's replace, then it's a move, then it's a copy. Uh, kind of similar example. It doesn't really make sense considering this messaging context. Uh, it's just the paths are just A slash B slash C, the values are just foo. So it would have been nice if that was something that made... Uh, some sense in trying to understand what the intention of this use case was. Um, Cause it seems we've got a chat app and then we're just writing some garbage. Um, how that helps us understand how to implement a chat app. I'm not really sure. Or it doesn't really seem to, it would be nice if the next version of this draft uh, maybe had something better. Alrighty. Uh, so chapter 3.1, creating a subscription. The subscribe header on a get request modifies the method semantics to request a subscription to future updates to the data, rather than only the current version of the representation data. A client requests a subscription by issuing a get request with a subscribe header. For example, so a subscribe header that's empty, it has no value. 
or a subscribe header with the value set to keep alive or a subscribe header set to the value keep alive equals a value in seconds. If a server implements subscribe, it must include a subscribe header in its response. The server then should keep the connection open and send updates over it. In general, a server that implements subscriptions promises to keep its subscribe clients up to date by sending changes until the client closes the subscription. A subscription is different from a GET connection, e.g. a TCP connection or HTTP2 stream, if a client requests the subscribe header set to keep alive. Then the subscription will be remembered even after the GET connection closes. A subscription can be resumed by the client issuing another GET request with a subscribe header. All right, so this kind of answers the question before. The transport is either a TCP connection or a HTTP2 stream. So it seems HTTP version 2 kind of did something new that TCP, like as an alternative transport to TCP. So you, HTTP version 2 seems to be like, hey, you, HTTP version 1 seems to be TCP. HTTP version 2 seems to either be TCP or um, this new HTTP 2 stream, like a new new way of transport. So they're saying the subscribe header can either be TCP connection or, H or a HTTP 2 stream. Um, and we can see that it'll, it will do the keep alive. If a client requests subscribe, keep alive, and then the connection will be remembered even after the GET connection closes. Subscription can be resumed by the client issuing another GET with the subscribe header. Um, so I, that would apply even if there's keep alive equal to a value of seconds. Um, I'm not sure whether it would uh, be the case if uh, there isn't a value on the keep alive header. Maybe it's implied then um, that just a subscribe header provided without a value should equal or default to uh, the keep alive value. Chapter 3.2, sending multiple updates per get. To send multiple updates, a server concatenates multiple sub-responses into a single response body. Each sub-response must contain its own headers and body. Each sub-response must have a known length, which means it must contain one of the following headers. Content length equal to an integer, transfer encoding equal to chunked, or patches equal to an integer. Each sub-response must have both headers and a body. The body may be zero length. Chapter 3.3, continuing of subscription. Even if a connection closes, a subscription might still be active. If a service response headers for a connection contained, subscribe, keep alive, or subscribe, keep alive equals a value in seconds. Then the server should keep the subscription open even after the connection closes. This means that the server promises to keep enough history to merge with the client when the client comes back online. Okay, okay, okay. So there's a difference here between connections, like HTTP connections, and a subscription. So they've kind of become uh, disentangled uh, or independent of each other, whatever the right terminology is. If you know the right terminology, leave a comment below. But uh, so a subscription uh, could happen even without any connection uh, to the client um, under these cases. So for instance, the server uh, could maybe have it started off with like 500 connections to clients. Um, and then what happens is uh, maybe 200 of those then drop offline. Well, the server, if, yeah, well, the server could then uh, maintain a subscription um, where it's trying to, I guess, like a magazine where they're still writing uh, prints uh, for those clients um, to eventually be delivered. So they're still maintaining the history tree uh, for those clients. Um, so that way, when the clients do pop back online, uh, those clients will have a history tree um, available. 
And I imagine the reason why they're doing it this way is so that uh, if all the clients are up to date, then the server uh, could just trim its history um, where it can just keep the latest and it can just prune its history and move its history to like cold storage, which is way cheaper. Um, and maybe there's a timeout for that. So active subscriptions that haven't expired the timeout could be on like uh, uh, like RAM. Uh, after a certain timeout, let's say like a week, then it moves into hard drive storage. Uh, well, maybe like a day it moves into hard drive storage. Then after like a, uh, a few days, then it moves to like S3. Uh, and then it just trickles down the S3 tiers. Um, and once all of the things are done, like all the subscriptions have, or if all the, you know, it's been only five minutes and all the subscriptions are done, then it could just push it directly to um, like Amazon Deep, Ar Deep Archive S3 storage um, immediately. So it doesn't have to go through that whole trickling um, in the meantime. So maybe that's what that's about. Because um, otherwise, what you end up having is the server would have to maintain um, one of the complexity series, the server is going to have to maintain subscriptions for a ton of clients. So I wonder how this would work in a peer to peer, like a many to many type connection situation uh, versus just the many to one. Uh, like many clients to one entity um, type situation. Uh, because a many to one situation uh, would be quite involved uh, in terms of the requirements handling the subscriptions for thousands or millions um, of clients. So maybe they'll go into this a little bit more and it seems like they will. Alrighty, so when the client reconnects, you may specify the most recent versions it saw from the server using the parent's header. This tells the server which versions of state to catch it up from. The server can suggest how long it will wait for the client by responding with subscribe, keep alive equals a value in seconds. A server should wait at least seconds after a connection closes before dropping the subscription and clearing its history. Okay, okay. All right, so um, for a request, okay, so a request can be subscribe or subscribe, keep alive, or subscribe, keep alive seconds. So this is actually here a request by the client to say, hey, keep it alive for this many seconds, right? Uh, this one is, I'm still not sure what this use case is going to be. Um, However, yeah, so this is like their preference. But no matter what happens, uh, the server is going to be sending back um, keep alive or if they have a timeout, keep alive seconds. And I assume this, may, this response may differ with what the user's preference could be. Um, and that servers probably want to always specify the seconds so they always have a timeout because otherwise, it could be easy to do an attack where you just say like, hey, keep everything alive forever and then the server just gets overwhelmed. Um, or maybe you can say keep alive forever and it, they just maintain like a blockchain, like a distributed blockchain or get history where they do track all of the changes. Um, but if they are doing any pruning, um, they probably want to do that. Um, so it would be interesting kind of discuss uh with the uh or you know figure out further uh you know what the criteria would be between uh with this timeout without this timeout like what as an implementer your considerations would be here because the paper is kind of giving us like the protocol but it's so far it hasn't really helped us in figuring out as an implementer, what should our considerations be in tweaking or customizing or implementing uh, this protocol? Okay. Chapter 3.4, ending a subscription. 
Servers and clients may drop a subscription at any time, no matter the value of Keep Alive. A client may reconnect by issuing a new GET request with a new subscribe header. If a subscription is set to Keep Alive, then closing the TCP or QUICK connection won't end the subscription. Thus, a client needs a way to explicitly end the subscription. In HTTP 1, this is by sending the text for GET new line or the TCP connection. In HTTP 2, this is by issuing a CLOSE event to the GET request stream. Alternatively, since today's web browser do not support sending extra text after a request body, the client can issue a fresh request specified as a forget method. So this clarifies uh, the discussion point from earlier. Uh, so in, with HTTP 1, we have TCP or quick, uh, or maybe TCP anyway. Um, and yeah, so we have TCP and quick as the transports. We also have HTTP 2 with its own subscription semantics. We have TCP subscription uh, semantics. So I wonder which one quick is used for. Is quick used for HTTP subscription or is quick used for HTTP 1's one? Uh, alternatively, it seems we're introducing a new forget method rather than this old school forget body um, new line. So that's adding some clarification to the discussion point from earlier. And it also clarifies that point about uh, the connection may drop. Um, however, okay, oh, okay. So uh, it can actually drop a subscription. Um, a client may reconnect by issuing a new GET request with a new subscribe header. So even despite Keep Alive and the preferences stated there, it's kind of like a promise, but that promise can be broken. So it's not really like a contract, it's just like a, a wishful promise. Um, so not just connections can be broken, but also the subscriptions. Um, and then it can just be reinstantiated from the way we knew from earlier. So chapter 3.5, errors. If a server has dropped the history that a client requests, the server can return a 410 gone response to tell the client, sorry, I don't have the history necessary to synchronize with you. Okay, so that poses into the discussion earlier about um, the pruning of the history. So maybe they pruned the history and this client has now popped up after a year later. Um, once that timeout has kind of occurred, that expiration timeout, and they've pruned the history. Um, in which case, then uh, they would then have to, because if we're considering like a history, like a change log, right, then maybe the person inserted blah on line three of the beginning of this document. But now over the year, this document has changed dramatically with maybe a million new edits, right? And so the only option there is maybe to re-attempt to uh, add it, but it's kind of like manual intervention at that point because there's no way to, uh, I guess, assume safely that that blah is still desired at that point um, in that document. Um, unless it, maybe it's still there, uh, like that paragraph hasn't really changed, um, then maybe it's safe to merge it. However, um, it could be just completely different document now, uh, at least for that paragraph. It may not even resemble anymore, in which case that change will probably just get rejected. Um, so it's probably saying here, it's like, well, now it's up to the client, I guess, to figure out how to do it well. Like it, the algorithm maybe can't do it by itself. Chapter four, design goals. This spec is designed to be one, backwards compatible with existing HTTP. Two, easy to implement, simple, synchronizers with. For instance, it should be easy to write a read-only synchronizer for an append-only log. Three, possible to implement arbitrary synchronization algorithms. For instance, these extensions support any operational transform or CRDT algorithm.
Chapter 5, Use Cases. Chapter 5.1, Dynamic Resources. Animating a GIF. Braid allows resources to become inherently dynamic, able to change over time. You can use this to make a resource animate. In this example, a service streams changes to a GIF file in a sequence of patches. When the client renders the new state of the GIF, after each patch, a new frame of animation is displayed. So we have a request. It's using the get method directed to slash animated dash braid dot gif and it has a subscribe header with no value the response is with http slash 1.1 1 .1, 209 subscribe the content type is set to image slash gif it has two patches the first patch has a content length of an integer a content range of bytes 100 to 200 and some binary data the second patch segment of the response has a content length of an integer, a content range of bytes, and one integer to another integer, and some binary data. So, so what's happening here is uh, we've got an image, and that image is changing. I imagine this could be so GIFs or GIFs. They have um, they're kind of animated. They're one of the formats that support animation. These days, PNGs, I think, also support animation, but it's one of the new versions of PNGs. And there's probably some other formats now that are more modern that also support animation. But GIFs are really large for animation. Like, if you're actually going to show something that has, like, hundreds of frames, you're probably better off just using, like, a, a video format um, for it. However, what they're saying here is, I assume like a JPEG or something like that could have been a better example for this. Because what they're saying is we could show an image and then modify that image's data over time. And that way it appears as if it's animating. Um, and we could do that by actually only modifying portions um, of that image, uh, which would be pretty nifty. Um, so we could fetch an image uh, and then we could directly modify only the portions of it that have changed. Um, so that could be nifty. Uh, or we, we just replace all of it, but with like the one URL. Uh, so it would be kind of cool, right? Like if you have your little image HTML element, you have source to this GIF and you say subscribe. And then the server, without you doing anything else as a front end developer, uh, is automatically now updating um, that image uh, for you um, without you actually having to code anything in React or your VDOM or your JavaScript or anything like that to provide this dynamic updates. Uh, instead, this is actually handled as part of HTTP. The image is just going to be updating with whatever's latest. Seems like that's what they're getting at. The GIF kind of is a bad example here because it has inbuilt animation. Um, when I think for this, they're trying to get at something that doesn't have inbuilt animation. So kind of really cool here. Um, we started to kind of see the power of braid coming through. Chapter 5.2, dynamic proxies and caches. Since updates aren't pushed, today's web often uses timeouts to trigger a cache becoming stale. Unfortunately, sometimes the timeout is wrong and caches become out of date. And we have to wait for an unknown cache to time out before we can see the new version of something. As a result, programmers have learned to force reload pages habitually, and caches become less efficient than necessary. A cache supporting the braid extensions, however, will automatically update whenever a change occurs. If a client starts a GET subscription with a proxy, the proxy will then start and maintain a GET subscription with the origin server. The origin server will promise to send the proxy updates over its GET subscription, and the proxy will then relay these changes to all connected clients. If a set of clients and servers all support Braid, they will never need to force reload caches for any data amongst them. Okay, this is really cool. So, uh, like the squid proxy is something you can, it's kind of like a caching proxy, you can use it. Um, in like an enterprise or an office situation, depending if you have that many employees. Um, so 
there's two examples of when like the squid proxy becomes useful. So one example is as like a little internal CDN or a cache. Uh, so let's say you have a business um, and you have a thousand employees and uh, 500 of them are running Mac um, or Linux, let's say Linux. And they need to fetch this apt like repository and all these software updates because there's a new version of some software that your company is running and it's going to install it on all these servers or desktop computers or whatever, right? So rather than then in your company, uh, these all these machines, these 500,000 machines are all fetching it themselves individually, causing a thousand connections out. Then instead, this little proxy that you're having uh, you direct all the clients to this proxy, it fetches it once and then stores it locally. And then the thousand connections just have to fetch it from this local proxy. This one server you have in the um, uh, in the office. Now, uh, the new version of Mac, Big Sur, it actually has that ability built in. So even if you're at home, you can actually do this. Uh, if you go into the about um, settings, uh, so, click the Mac logo, go system preferences, go into um, network. There's actually, I think, content caching or something like that. And you can enable that. And then any of your iOS devices or Apple tool, Apple TV, any of your Apple products, they'll go to that Mac first uh, to fetch the iOS updates uh, or uh, like operating system updates or app store updates. So the Mac will kind of cache it. So that way, even at your home with your four family members, uh, your Mac will now serve as like your little uh, caching proxy um, only for Apple updates. So, and with all the security and benefits and all that crap you can expect from Apple's marketing. Now, uh, here, what it's kind of saying is for that operation, uh, these caches rather than just like invalidating like having all these rules of like okay here's the e tag which is the identify if the e tag changes so like when you do like a normal http request uh you get these little e tags and responses and then if you request uh you can just send the header uh with the e tag and if the e tag is the same it'll return back like not modified um, and then that way you can just use your local cache if you, you know, so you would send the e-tag if you still have it in your local cache. Um, now, if the e-tag is changed, then you invalidate your local cache and you fetch the new one. Um, uh, variants before e-tags were things like last modified or um, uh, uh, when the cache should invalidate. I can't remember the header um, for that offhand. Um, when what this is saying is you can kind of do away with all that nonsense um, of all this manual or or kind of like long polling style ways of invalidating your cache or revalidating it and instead just do a subscription. So you just subscribe and then it just kind of like feeds in. And to some extent, this is kind of what like uh, uh, IPFS and all those things are kind of like promising for the future, these like, uh, distributed file systems which is that hey i should be able to work on my file system and then it just like uh shares to everybody who i wanted to share with or even with the whole world or other planets uh, <laughs> uh, with her ambitious marketing and uh, when this is actually kind of providing a way to uh to do it um while eliminating a lot of the crap um for it so Really cool here, and it's kind of nifty how they kind of just giving like a nice protocol with web standards, and it still seems as up to the server to figure this out, and that's I guess why this sync nine is one of the algorithms, um, and they also have uh, you know it's still up to the server implementation, so it's kind of cool how they focused on this. Um, I, I'm really really impressed. Chapter five point three. A serverless chat example. A Braid web application can operate offline. A user can use the app from an airplane and the edits can synchronize when they regain internet connections. Additionally, the Braid protocol can be expressed over peer-to-peer -peer transports. For example, Braid WebRTC. Two, support a peer-to-peer -peer synchronization without a server. Braid HTTP clients will be able to interoperate with Braid WebRTC clients. 
For example, a chat application might be served and synchronized on Braid HTTP, while also establishing redundant peer-to-peer -peer connections on Braid WebRTC. The server could then be shut down, and users of the chat app could continue to send messages to one another. Imagine the server serves the current set of trusted clients IP addresses at the slash peers state. Each client then subscribes to the slash peers state with a request with a get method directed to slash peers, a subscribe header set to the value keep alive, and the body being an array of objects, each object having an IP field set to an IP address and a pub key set to a public key uh, value. Each peer can then choose a set of those peers with whom to establish a WebRTC connection. It will then exchange braid messages with those peers over that connection. So this is kind of interesting. This is very similar to uh, Torrent's WebSeed extension to the Torrent protocol. So for instance, uh, with the Torrent protocol, the BitTorrent tor protocol, uh, you have a file you want to share. So to share this file, you create a torrent file. Uh, and that torrent file kind of communicates uh, how torrent clients should uh, uh, obtain this file. And the way they it, that's communicated is the torrent is a, it breaks the, the breaks the file into chunks and then checks some of those chunks. And the torrent file is kind of like a uh, little mapping of what are all the chunks in this file and then what are the checksums? Um, so for instance, byte ranges zero to 32 result in this checksum here. And what this then says is uh, it then publishes uh, this torrent to like a DHT. So it checksums the whole thing and then publishes it to a distributed hash table. Uh, and then other torrent clients who are accessing that distributed hash table, they can say, okay, um, I know that these IP addresses, um, so the hash table is saying this, uh, this uh, torrent uh, is located on all these IP addresses um, or all these peers, right? So what happens is you say, okay, I, I need this torrent. This torrent now validates that what I'm getting is correct. It also says where the chunks are located because of that distributed hash table. Um, and then it can fetch those chunks from all the peers that actually have it. And that's also how you can find out who's a seeder versus a leecher, um, because a seeder will actually have all the chunks um, when a leecher won't. Uh, and how you can, the distributed hash table, like the clients will implement, be kind of nodes in that distributed hash table. Uh, that's a separate subject, it's not really related to this. The reason I'm bringing torrents up is because what many people don't know is in this little torrent file, uh, you can actually specify with one of the amendments to the torrent protocol, a HTTP fallback URL um, to get it. So because we know uh, the checksums of this file, it doesn't really matter where we get it from because we can download it. We know exactly like what chunks we should expect. And if we do like uh, fetch it from HTTP or wherever it is, um, we can just, if that URL supports fetching segments, uh, that's really up to the server and whether or not it allows you to just fetch a specific part um, of a file. Uh, if it does, then we can fetch just that part and then validate that the checksum is what we expected it to be from the torrent uh, file. So what that, uh, so it's kind of nifty here because uh, it provides like a peer-to-peer -peer layer on things that actually um, uh, with that torrent situation, it provides this peer-to-peer -peer layer on things that actually have um, uh, fallbacks on like say Amazon S3. So you, you could totally host like your video on S3 and then just use WebTorrent um, to kind of seed it with this peer-to-peer -peer layer in case S3 goes down. Um, or if the peer-to-peers are just so slow, it can go back to the web seed. Um, so that's something about torrents people don't really know, and it can actually work way well. Um, so th this is kind of like a similar thing where the even if the server goes down or it's inaccessible, um, 
state can still be synchronizing in a completely dis- distributed and even organic way among peers and then go back and then uh, consolidate itself on the server. Chapter 6, Related Work. Chapter 6.1, Web Frameworks. Web applications typically synchronize the state of a client and server with layers of models, views, and controllers in web frameworks. By automating synchronization with HTTP, programmers have to write fewer layers of code on top of it. And they have an example here. Uh, let me see if I can articulate it. So for instance, for legacy websites, today's web pages are generated from multiple layers of state. Each layer has a different API. Inside the non-standard state API, we have a client, there's a web page DOM that has states related to a HTML templates, which has states related to JS models. And that is then put over HTTP, and then that has a state or views which has a state into controllers, has a state into models, and has a state into a database, and then eventually a server. And the conclusion of that is today's programmers have to learn each API and wire them together, making sure that changes to shared state synchronize across all layers in computers. So this MVC model uh, that they're saying is on the server uh, is very PHP style. Um, Zen Framework uh, is one of the examples of that. And, but on the client side, you also had the MVC uh, side with Backbone. Backbone was a popular library in like the noughts. Um, and it kind of phased out around 2013 uh, onwards or 2014, pretty much as soon as React became a thing, MVC just completely died off. Um, so you could have MVC on both, but MVC is like a way of managing um, your data into models, uh, which your controllers can interact with, which is like your business logic and then render it into views. Uh, so you could do the same thing here. So JS, for instance, is your controllers, your HTML templates and your web page are kind of like your views. Um, and React's kind of complicated this a bit by you having your state, um, which is kind of like your database uh, and Redux is kind of like your controllers um, and to some extent, your components are your views. Uh, so that's kind of the way you can think about it in modern day. But the synchronization between all of this, like React has to redo all of that. And then you have on the other side, um, React doesn't care at all about the server, like about how the state has to synchronize it. Um, so for instance, in a typical React app, you could probably pass it to like a Ajax request and then do everything that way we can do it via GraphQL. That's kind of like just this transport layer, right? Like how do we get the client talking towards the server? It's either like GraphQL or like an Ajax request, it doesn't really matter. Um, but even though you're doing GraphQL or Ajax, you still need to figure out how you get what all these clients are saying stored into a database and manage conflicts or manage whatnot. Now for a typical app, conflict management is your, your hobby app or your little small business app, not really a thing. Um, unless you wanted to build your own chat app, but why bother? You could just use Discus or uh, some other widget for that. Like it's kind of a sole problem. You just stick a little widget in and then they kind of do it. Um, however, uh, this kind of provides the opportunity rather than just always delegating these things to these monopolized open source projects. Um, or even paid components. Instead, HTTP, uh, Braid is actually thinking, why don't we just solve it at the protocol layer? layer? So we can just solve all of this very cleanly uh, and we don't have to invent all this um, lineage of uh, nonsense trying to resolve this at different layers. Let's just solve it right at the layer where it needs to be solved at. Um, and then we can just have like a little clean slate going forward. So for instance, for Braid websites, it says Braid generalizes HTTP into a standard for synchronizing state within and between websites. So a standard state API in Braid is just state, 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 over HTTP and state, 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 state. So there's no more uh, 
database model controllers views js models html templates web page them all having to synchronize between each other said everything's synchronized uh through braid and it just has to communicate over http um, which will probably depend on like your little braid server implementation and your little braid client implementation um and then you can select uh knowing a little bit more about braid you get to select like your uh, conflict resolution algorithm and things like that um, within the little library you pick. Uh, now, obviously, you'll still have like a database where I guess you're storing it. Um, however, this is where the kind of question gets a little bit interesting uh, and where a discussion is to be had because uh, in the example earlier, they present a server uh, and a peer-to-peer kind of fallback for that server. So the server is kind of like the arbiter of truth, or maybe it's even just a relay network, like a scuttlebutt type pub, where it's like a relayer of this conflict. Because there's a, uh, when it comes to conflict resolution, uh, we're very now used to centralized repositories of what is the arbiter of truth. Um, so for instance, if we post to um, Facebook, then uh, that post we're now expecting on, how would I say this? Let's say we have a Google document and, you know, there's 10 peers interacting with this Google document and this Google document is stored in the cloud, right? So we do our little conflicts. Sometimes we may go offline, but at the end of the day, it ends up syncing to Google. And when we check back in or we introduce a new person, Google is the arbiter of truth. Now, everything consolidates back to what Google says it is. If Google says it's this, we take Google's word for it. And there's no opportunity for, like, say, myself, Ben, making a document with Joe Blogs, uh, for us to uh, have a subjective uh, and mutual version of this document that Google does not know about because we're relying on Google being the arbiter and the the centralized repository of what is truth regarding this document. Now, now before these centralized repositories of knowledge, uh, knowledge was very decentralized. If we imagine with our friends, we have a event, we go to a party, and then uh, person A and B, they go off from one corner, they do some things, they meet up some other time. Then this person C and D, they go somewhere else, do some other things, they meet up, they see each other bit by bit. And then they get wasted and they don't really remember what happens. Now, when they talk the next day, they all have little fragments of what occurred. And then they kind of are in that uh, part of resolving conflicts, resolving the events that have transpired. So they're all discussing, trying to figure out the sequence of events. And they're pretty much just doing the same type of conflict resolution, just in real time as humans rather than as machines and algorithms. Um, so they're trying to piece together that night that occurred. Uh, the movie Hangover is, is essentially a conflict resolution <laughs> uh, in the same way that we're talking about in these algorithms. Um, so uh, what you have is, uh, however, it's very different there uh, compared to where we just rely on Google to tell us what is true, like to, where we rely on Google to be like, hey, what happened the night before? And so what's happening is each person has their own version of events and now they're trying to talk about it and find out what happened. Um, so each person is actually their own truth arbiter in the world. And then they project that truth to other people. Uh, and then it's up to those other people to either accept or reject those pieces of truth. And this is actually how the legal system to some extent works. We can accuse someone of being guilty, but whether or not they are or they aren't is up to how we resolve the truth of whether or not they're guilty. We get a, you know, a prosecution and defense to make the cases. Uh, and they will then um, try and convince a jury or a judge what the actual events were and then what the punishment uh, for those events should be. Um, and the person may be innocent, maybe it didn't happen in the exact way it was, maybe they are guilty, they are guilty, are they cold-blooded, whatever it is, right? But the point of that is, so there's a shared mutual consensual, uh, said mutual uh uh, and considerate approach to what happened, uh, consideration to what happened, to what occurred. Because um, you don't want to just flip a coin and be like, that's what truth is. You need to actually be uh, considerate 
um, and to some extent as sophisticated as necessary in figuring out uh, what actually transpired, uh, especially uh, societies that were just based on flipping a coin to figure out who is true or, or omens that may not have actually uh, been uh, had a high probability of actually being causal. Uh, um, they were just correlated omens uh, more than they were causal omens. Um, they they didn't produce uh, fair outcomes compared to something that could resolve conflicts in a good way um, or in a more accurate uh, way. And accurate in terms of more causal than correlated or at least in let's say resolving conflicts in a Google document, to some extent causal as well, right? Like if multiple people are writing in uh, the same paragraph, how do you resolve that? So you need to actually find out what was the intent with each uh, additional character. Um, were they meaning to override something? Were they meaning to append something? Were they meaning to res uh, remove something? Uh, so when you have... Um, the resulting paragraph after all of these edits from these different people, uh, you actually have something which result uh, was hopefully caused by their intentions rather than something that just correlated with their intentions uh, and became gibberish. So uh, it's, it's kind of uh, nifty here uh, a lot. And I, I hope that example kind of adds a little bit more uh, substance to understanding um, this this topic so chapter 6.2 existing ietf standards so iet ietf uh what do they stand for internet engineering task force sounds like uh donald trump's space force all right a number of ietf specifications already standardize aspects of synchronization for specific domains imap uh, which is the Internet Mail Access Protocol, which is defined in RFC 3501, provides synchronization of email. WebDAV provides the synchronization of collections and has been extended specifically for calendar data in CalDAV, which is defined in RFC 4791, and vCards in RFC 65350. More recently, JMAP, RFC 8622, Zero provides an updated method of synchronization, supporting mail, calendars, and contacts. I never heard of JMAP before. That's nifty. All right, chapter seven, IANA considerations. IANA stands for Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Chapter seven point one, header field registration. HTTP header fields are registered within the message headers. Registry maintained at inr.org assignment slash message headers. This document defines the following HTTP header fields. So their associated registry entries have been associated accordingly to the permanent registrations below. See BCP 90, which is called registration procedures for message header fields. So we have a table here. It's got uh, four columns. The first one is header field name. Second column is protocol. The third protocol is status. I mean, the third column is status. And the fourth and last column is reference. In header field name, uh, by row, we have uh, header field name of version, protocol, HTTP, status, experimental, reference, section two, section two in this document. Then we have parents, protocol, HTTP, status, experimental, reference, section two. Merge type, protocol, HTTP, status, experimental, section 2.2. Patches, HTTP, experimental, section 2.3, subscribe, protocol, HTTP, status, experimental, and reference, section 4. The change controller is IETF. Uh, there's an email address and Internet Engineering Task Force. So they're just kind of saying um, to amend uh, the message headers in the other documents. Uh, this is their proposal for what should go there. Chapter eight, security considerations. Uh, they're marking that as a to-do. Chapter nine, conventions. That's saying how certain words should be defined uh, in this document uh, for RFCs, which are requests for comments, which is kind of like the standards which the internet is based off. Um, they're kind of like papers, but 
uh, yeah, they're kind of just like papers in a scientific community, but instead it's like an industry, uh, an industry paper, which is referenceable and cross-referenceable, and you can click them and go between, as you can see in this document. So there's a paper on like how the keywords must, must not, required, shall, shall not, should, should not, recommend, may, and optional actually be interpreted, and that's defined in RFC 2119. Then we've got our copyright notice, we've got our references, and we've got our normative references and our informative references. Uh, so that's kind of cool. We get to see what is the uh, basis of this paper, what it's extending in these normative references. And we get to see things that informed the direction of this paper with these references. Uh, very cool. Uh, I This is one of the things that is so cool about the science world is uh, they try and represent um, the sources of injection of data that our neurons store. So we can consider uh, this paper as a um, injection of certain data into certain neurons. And if we actually use our literacy, uh, then we can actually start writing hyperlinks, not just with the neurons in our brain, but with the neurons of other people's brains. And we kind of create a literal um, interconnection or hyper weaving um, between brains. And uh, to some extent, I think that's where, you know, the origin like hyper, uh, HTTP stands for hypertext transfer protocol. Um, so that's kind of the initial uh, side here, which was um, how can we kind of make these research papers, because the web came from research institutions, how can we kind of make this uh, interconnected? And even before that, you still had papers and they would cite like where they're getting their ideas from, what's informing it. Um, and it's so cool, like non-academic uh, pa uh, patrons or, participants um of information or knowledge like say on youtube um it would go so far if they practiced um such citations and it's very difficult like it is it it's kind of a difference between passive consumption where you're just listening to something versus active consumption where as you're reading it you're taking notes if there's a word you don't know you write that word down in your vocab note like you're actively um interacting with the content and it's such a different way than just passively reading a book or passively reading a paper or passively reading an article on the internet or passively watching a YouTube video and just getting blasted by ads and then just auto playing the next one. Instead, it's complete deliberation. You wake up every morning, you know what you're going to do. You're going to read some stuff. Maybe there's some variance in it. But each moment you're, you're focused and you're active on it. Um, it's such a inspiring alternative to the passive consumption of social media. Um, all right, so these are all the people to thank for this paper. Um, we have some acknowledgements. Uh, so chapter 12, acknowledgements. In addition to the authors, the spec contains intellectual contributions from the following people. Steph Gentle, Maita Milutinovic, Milutinovic, Milu. Milu, Milu, Milu Tinovic. Let's see how we say this. Get some active reading going. Milu Tinovic, Sarah Allen, Dwayne Johnson, Travis Kriplian. Let's make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Yep, Kriplian. Marius Nita, Paul Pam, Morgan Dixon, Karthik Palin. Palanipian. Let's see if I can. Palanipian. We thank the following people for key feedback on previous drafts Austin Wright, Martin Thompson, Eric Kinnear, Ollie Van Hoja, or Van Hoya, Julian Reschke. Let's see. Reschke. And we also thank. Martin Nottingham, Fred Baker, Adam Roach, and Barry Lieber, Lieber for facilitating a productive environment. In chapter 13, authors addresses. For more information, the authors of this document are best contacted by the internet mail. So we've got Michael Tuman at Invisible College. 
Berkeley. Greg Little at Invisible College Berkeley. Rafi Volker, Bard, who's at Bard College, and Brian Bellamy at Invisible College. So I have a uh, interview I'm, or a conversation with Michael Tuman, uh, and it'll either go into a live stream or a chat, but I'll work over through some of the discussion topics of this. Um, that's happening uh, tomorrow morning. So I'm very much looking forward to kind of getting this work out into more eyes and also helping my own understanding with it. Uh, I've made a few blunders uh, reading this out loud, so I need to edit it, um, which always sucks. Uh, but I'll edit it out and uh, we'll see what happens. Let me know in the comments if you enjoy this format and uh if you actually appreciate the commentary whether or not you just want me to attempt to read it um and any feedback and suggestions is helpful because i have like 200 papers that i want to work through so i understand the decentralized web from a fundamental level while i try and build a decentralized youtube at Bevery. and uh yeah if you want to participate in any of this also read papers or discuss the papers with me uh, all the links will be in the details below and you can join us uh, at bevery.me or on the Discord server at bevery.me slash Discord. Uh, thanks so much. My name is Benjamin Lupton uh, and thanks the again to the Braid Authors for doing such a great job on this. Bye.